Let's welcome Josh as he comes in and gives Thank you. Ooh, good morning, Redeemer San Diego. Man, it is awesome to be with you. I'm so honored to be here for this Drawing Near to God series. A little bit about me. So I came to know Jesus back in college. I was at the University of Oregon. So go Ducks, quack, quack, right? And I'm there and I decided, man, God, I want to try this thing. I want to try and follow you on try Christianity. And so I went and I found a Christian campus group and I said, hey, how do I do this? How do I follow God? How do I draw near to God? And they told me, okay, well, you do music, so why don't you lead worship at our weekly gathering? And so uh, I was like, all right, I don't know that I'm a Christian yet, but okay, so I'm leading worship at kind of this <laughs> gathering every Monday night. And then I'm like, okay, well, what's next? And they're like, well, are you studying your Bible? We have a Thursday night Bible study. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go to that. So I go to that, and we're digging into God's Word, and it's good, and I'm learning stuff, but I still feel really empty, and like God's kind of distant. So I'm like, all right, well, what am I missing? What's next? And they were like, well, are you praying? Because we have this 6 a.m. prayer gathering every Wednesday morning. And I was like, dude, that sounds like Navy SEALs, gung-ho for Jesus. Like, I am all in. And uh, I, I'm going to show God that I'm really serious about this. So I'm getting up at 6 a.m. to go pray. And my roommates are, like, hungover. They're like, where are you going, dude? I'm like, I'm going to go pray, you know. And, and, and yeah, I still felt empty. And so I was like, well, what am I missing? And they're like, well, are you sharing your faith? And so they gave me a stack of tracks and they unleashed me like a wolf on all my unsuspecting victims out there, this brand new, you know, and I'm laid back. We had a lot of fun conversations about God, but I found myself in this catch 22 where the more stuff that I was doing for God, the more distant God seemed. And the irony was that now that I was doing all this stuff, though, I was actually getting a lot of applause from my new Christian friends in this community, they were going, man, look at Josh, he's on fire for Jesus, he's doing all this stuff. And so I felt myself going, well, I don't wanna let them down, so I'm gonna keep doing all this stuff. But internally, I began questioning, like, God, this doesn't seem to be working. And I felt like I just had to kind of figure that out on my own. So this led to this season of all this activity and finally it kind of built up that year. And uh, then at the end of the year, I'm like, I know what will fix it. I'll go on a mission trip, right? Because in my mind, that was the, the big one. In my mind, it was kind of like God was just waiting to make sure I was all in. I needed to kind of prove to God how serious I was about him and that I would be all in. And so I, I went to this mission trip. It was in Japan. And uh, this group I was a part of, a, a campus group, they, they went to Japan. And we had this great experience there. And, and actually, the Japanese church that I was a part of there was amazing. I, I encountered God in some fresh ways in there. And, and uh, they seemed to just rest in the love of of God for them. It's not like they weren't doing stuff. They were doing stuff, but it wasn't characterized by the same striving that I had in my own life. And I remember thinking like, that's beautiful, but I don't get it. I don't understand how to make sense of that. And so I actually came home at the end of that summer more frustrated than ever. And just, so the climax of the story is the end of that summer, I have a landscaping job three days by myself in this backyard and I am, it's August so it's hot and I'm sweaty and I'm pulling up these deep shrubs, these roots from like these shrubs and flowers and a tree and, and in retrospect it felt symbolic because I was back there and I was also digging up these deep roots in my soul. I go, I'm sorry, I'm kind of dramatic, but like, God, do I really believe this? And is this really working? And I kind of got to the end of that three days and I'm surrounded by all this uprooted dust and dirt and death. And I remember just screaming out in that backyard, forget it, God, forget it. And there are a number of expletives thrown in there too. And I was just like, God, if this is who you are, I want nothing to do with you. And I was done. Like, I wasn't going to change my mind tomorrow. It's like, I tried it. I gave it my best shot all year, went after it, and it didn't work. You're too far away if you even exist. I, I, I'm done. And I don't remember if it was a minute later or an hour later. But all I remember is finding myself for the first time surrounded in that backyard by the presence of Jesus. Like more real and tangible than in the room right here with you all, right? Like it was like being in the spirit or like in the room with the king. And what I heard Jesus say to me was, Josh, you've had this whole thing backwards. Like you thought this was about you coming out to find me. And the whole time I've been the one coming out to find you. 
<laughs> it was like God's mic drop, right? And that just shook everything I thought I knew about God and the gospel and Christianity and everything like upside down on its head. It wasn't about me going after God. It was about God coming after me. And I began to get the word grace because I was experiencing the presence of grace and going like, oh my gosh, I've had it backwards. Like, all these verses I'd been reading began coming to life, like in Ephesians, where Paul says, it is by grace through faith you've been saved. And I realized, I thought I had that backwards. Like, I thought it was by grace through faith. I, I mean, by faith, I, I thought it was like, God, I come to you with my faith, and I show you how serious I am and how many things I'm willing to do uh, by faith. And then that creates this channel where you're like, okay, I'll give you some of my grace now. And realizing that's backwards. It actually starts with God's gracious goodness, who God is. And faith is simply getting our eyes off ourselves to receive the God who's come for us in Christ. The gospel is not about us going out to find God. It's about God coming to find us. Today, I want to talk to you about the pursuing God. The God who comes relentlessly after us in Christ. Christ. Uh, We're going to be in Luke chapter 15. And so if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, Luke chapter 15. But I want to ask the question today, what if it's not so much about your pursuit of God, but about God's pursuit of you? How would that change how you draw near to God if you're drawing near not to try and get out to some distant God who's running the other direction, but actually if you were drawing near to the God who has already drawn close to you in Christ? Because you see, I think often in our culture, we often treat God as if he's lost, as if he's gone missing, as if he's out in the universe hiding behind some cosmic couch somewhere for a game of hide and seek. And we got to go follow any trail of breadcrumbs we can to go find him. And so we'll talk about finding God, searching, searching for God, finding spirituality, exploring faith. But what if we have it backwards? What if God is the one pursuing us? What if you and I, our job is not so much to find God as it is to stop running? Not to discover the light, but rather to step out of the shadows. Not to earn divine love, but to receive it. The title for this message today is The Pursuing God. We're going to look at how we can draw near to the God who's already drawn near to us. So Luke chapter 15. Now, context here. Jesus, in this passage, he is being critiqued by the Pharisees. And he's being critiqued for the crowd he's hanging out with. Like, uh, they're basically going, man, in verse 2 it says, man, this man, he receives sinners and eats with them. And they're grumbling. So they're going, man, he's hanging out with the wrong crew. He is pursuing these folks that are, are on God's naughty list. He is hanging out with people that he shouldn't be hanging out with. He is pursuing and drawing near to folks who are distant from God. And that's wrong, they're saying. And, and so Jesus, he responds by telling this parable. Verse 3, it says, so he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? All right, well, the first thing Jesus says here is that God is like a reckless shepherd. He says, God is like a reckless shepherd. He tells them this story. He responds with a story going, okay, you got this shepherd. We'll call him Billy. And so Billy's out kind of keeping watch over his hundred sheep. And one day he realizes one's gone missing. So he leaves the 99 and he goes kind of bumbling through the, the, the brambles and climbing over the rocky crags. And he's going out to find that one lost sheep. And Jesus asked the obvious follow-up question, wouldn't you? And you and I, 21st century Westerners, with our total lack of sheep herding experience, we bob our heads up and down and we're like, yes, you love that sheep. You care immensely for that lost little lamblet, you know, and so you'll leave it all to go find him. Silly Westerners, right? Now the reality is, in the ancient Near East, for him to leave, he's actually leaving the 99 open and vulnerable to predators, to wolves and bears and robbers. And he might be coming back home. He might find that sheep and be coming back home with 99 problems and a sheep just one, right? And so I imagine, as Jesus asked, wouldn't you? I can imagine know-it-all Joe in the back. He kind of raises his hand. He's like, nah, Jesus, like, you stick with the safe bet. You stick with the 99, But Jesus says, God missed economics 101. 
God is a reckless shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after that one missing sheep. Jesus says here that God is like a reckless shepherd. Now, in the bigger picture, I get it's not reckless from one angle, going, God's sovereign, he knows what's happening, he's doing all this, but from another, it looks reckless in the eyes of a watching world, right? It looks reckless going, God, why would you go that far to get that one who in the eyes, like, man, is that really that valuable? Is it really that? Why would you go all the way to that bloodstained cross? Why would you go all the way to hell and back For him, for her, for me. That looks reckless in the eyes of a world that thinks God is distant rather than in the gospel vision of the God who has made us for himself and is coming after us to bring us back to himself. What I want to highlight for you here in this verse is that this is not a story about the sheep going out to find the shepherd. It's the story of the shepherd going out to find the sheep. Jesus is not giving instructions on how you can go out and find God and draw near to him. He is saying that if you're lost, God is coming to find and draw near to you. This challenges how we often use the word lost today. Uh, The word lost has fallen on hard times in church circles because often it can have a sense of being kind of arrogant or condescending, almost like this sense that we're the insiders who have all the answers, like we have kind of got our, uh, all the answers, we got our lives together, but the lost are those outsiders who need to get their act together and pick up their luggage and come find us to get the solutions. As if we are the ones who, man, we, we have got uh, this oasis of perfection in the middle of the desert, and they are the wandering thirsty ones who need to come and find us so they can drink of all the wonderful blessing that you and I have to give. As if, right? <laughs> like, the reality is, though, Jesus uses lost the opposite way. He flips the direction of movement in this passage. That in this passage, he flips the direction of movement saying lost doesn't mean you need to go find God. Lost means that God is coming to find you. Lost here does not mean idiot, fool, or outsider. Rather, lost means loved, valued, pursued. Lost means loved. If you don't believe me, check this out. Like, this is just one of three stories in a row. Jesus tells three lost stories in a row that all have the same theme. We've got like a lost sheep, then a lost coin, then a lost son. And all three, the emphasis is on the searcher, the one who is searching, waiting, longing, looking out for that which was lost. So in the next uh, parable he tells here, it's the story of the lost coin. And so you got this woman and she's got 10 coins and then one of her coins goes missing. And so what does she do? She lights a lamp, Jesus says, and she spends all night like searching through the house in the dark, like trying to find this one lost coin. So this woman, we'll call her Annie, she's on the hunt for this coin. And Jesus again asked the obvious question, like, well, wouldn't you? And I'm not so sure. And I love my sleep, right? Like, I don't know that I want to be up all night, like looking under the couch cushions and, you know, turning over lamps and looking under the cupboards and whatever else. Like, man, tomorrow I'm going to be tired, exhausted. I'm going to sleep through my alarm. I'm going to be late for work. I'm going to lose my job where I earn my coins, right? Better to just stick with the safe bet. Stick with the nine that I've got. But again, Jesus is saying that God slept through math class, right? Like he is actually on the hunt He is saying that, Jesus is essentially saying like, God is not an accountant who's calmly counting the cost. God is not a level-headed lady here demurely discerning the decision. No, Jesus is saying, God is like crazy Annie, tearing apart the house, flinging the lamp over, throwing out dishes, looking under the covers, flipping the cushions over to find that one missing Roosevelt. God is the pursuing God who comes after us. God is the pursuing God who is out to find you. And I wonder if there are maybe some of you this morning who are feeling lost right now in this season. Maybe you're feeling like, God, 
I've been trying to be good. I've been trying to do the things. I've been trying to go to church. I try and pray. I try and read my Bible sometimes. Maybe I'm doing the activity. Maybe I'm trying to be a good person out there and the things that I'm doing in, the, in my life. Like I'm trying to be good. But I just feel isolated. God, like you're distant. Like you're alone. Like it's not enough. I just feel absolutely your way. And the good news of the gospel that Jesus brings and lives is that God is committed to you. He is coming after you. That it's never been about you going out to find him, first and foremost. It's about him coming to find you. Jesus says that God is the pursuing God who draws near to us in our distance. And that means that it's never been about you going out to find him. It's about him coming to find you. You are the sheep who's lost in the ravines, stuck in the crags. And God, Jesus is Billy, the shepherd, who's coming out, leaving heaven to earth to come and get to you wherever you may be, that spot in the shadows and the lostness. You and I are like, dude, you're like the coin stuck under the cushions in the couch, right? Like it's kind of musty in there. Maybe you've gotten used to the smell and you're kind of, you know, man, this is just the way life is. I guess it's not that great. It kind of is hard, but hey, this is just, this is just life and God feels distant and that's the way it is. But I wonder this morning, can you hear the sound of the lamp crashing to the ground? Can you hear the sound of the dishes breaking and the couch getting turned over, the cushions flying, the revolutionary ruckus as God, that mighty hound of heaven gets closer as he's looking for you. He wants to find you in your distance, in your losses, and draw you near to himself. God is the pursuing God. Still raises the question, though, of when he finds us, how does he respond? Jesus picks that up in verse 5, where he says, And when he, when Billy the shepherd has found it, when he has found his sheep, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Jesus tells us that God embraces us with surprising joy. When he finds us, when he encounters us, when he draws near to us in our distance, he embraces us with surprising joy. It's interesting here, it strikes me that that word rejoicing, that when Billy finds his sheep, he rejoices over that sheep. And I don't know about you, but I would have expected a lecture, right? Like, man, do you know how worried I've been? Where have you been? Why can't you be like your 99 responsible older brothers and sisters, right? But Jesus tells us there's no finger wagging. There's no if you ever again that no. It's going, God is not an academic who finds and greets you with a lecture. God is a disco owner who encounters you and throws a party, Right? And it strikes me too here that, that then he says, man, that he puts the shepherd, Billy, he puts the sheep over his shoulders to carry the, shepherd, the sheep home himself. Billy puts that lamb on his shoulders to carry it home. And that is just like the gospel that when God finds you, he doesn't give you a roadmap to get home by yourself. He doesn't give you like the GPS cord and say, hey, take a right here or left here and then I'll see you when you get there. No, Jesus delights to carry you home himself, to actually carry you through life, to bring you to his kingdom himself. God delights not just to save you, but to carry you home, to sanctify you, to shape you in his image and to make you holy. It brings him joy to do this. And he does it, he doesn't just draw near, he stays near. That Jesus comes and he finds you and he gives you his spirit. He gives you his presence. That Jesus essentially with his spirit, he's throwing you over his shoulders to carry you home by his own strength, not your own. By his goodness, not your own. And yes, that's going to work its way into your life. And over time, we're going to become more like him. But it starts with grace. God rejoices over us not only in the start of the journey, but he rejoices to carry us home the entire way. You know, I, I think of Jim and Sarah 
uh, so they are, they, they, when they stepped into foster care. So my wife and I were uh, adoptive parents, uh, foster we were part of a foster care and adoption movement uh, back in the day and we're adoptive parents ourselves. And Jim and Sarah, they decided to step into foster care, uh, wanting to embrace and care for vulnerable children. And uh, the first youth they received, they received Misha into their home. And Misha had a tragic story. She had been uh, trafficked into the sex trade and had been uh, just brutal treatment. The things that she received, just horrible marks of a fallen world that, um, man, is just so heartbreaking, right? Uh, but Jim and Sarah, they welcomed Misha into their home. And when she got there, they threw her a big party. And she was shocked and surprised. I mean, they had, uh, man, just laughter and celebration. And the whole first week, it was so much fun. It was kind of the honeymoon phase. And they were, oh, it's so good to be with you. And oh, it's so good to be with you. It's so good to meet you. And they were so all so excited. But after that first week, it got tough, right? Misha began calling Sarah every name in the book, just loads of anger and rage and the stuff coming out of her story was just coming out at Misha. She called her every name in the book and mom was not one of them, right? But Jim, on the other hand, she would be very kind and affectionate, even flirtatious with, because you see, that's how she had learned to survive. Survival skills were like, man, uh, older or powerful men, were they, they were people that you, 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 you were kind to, to, to survive, but uh, women were competition. And so that, that backstory was now kind of playing itself out. And Jim and Sarah, they didn't play into it. Like Jim didn't respond to the flirtatious, any of that kind of thing, but it was hard. And they were going, man, this is really difficult. How are we going to navigate this? And so for six months, it was just really, really hard. And finally, at the end of six months, they were like, man, we need a date night. We need to get out of the town. So they hired a babysitter and they went out. They kind of dressed up to the nines. They went out on the town to like a fancy night out, great dinner. And um, man, they just felt so refreshed. And that time together was so good. And at the end of the night, they came home and they went through the front door and they were like, how was it? And the babysitter said, oh, great, Misha did great. She's sleeping upstairs. And they're like, okay, that's great. So they, they walked upstairs and went into their uh, bedroom and as they're getting ready, getting ready for bed, Jim walked into the bathroom and he said, oh no, like Sarah, don't come in here. And he began to go and try and close the door and Sarah came and she kind of got her foot in the door and began to try and get in. And Jim was trying to push to keep her out and Sarah was trying to push to get in. And she eventually kind of, you know, she was able to wedge her way in and step inside. And what she discovered was that Misha had taken her red lipstick and scrawled all over the bathroom mirror and all over the bathroom walls, F you, Ma, F you, Ma, F you, Ma. And Jim thought, oh no, man, we, we shouldn't have gone out. That was too hard on Misha. Now it's just stirred all this stuff up. And Sarah, it's been so hard. It's going to be hard on her. And he was just, oh, I, this is so difficult. And yet to his surprise, he turned and looked and Sarah was laughing. Like laughing and not just a little laugh. It began as a chuckle and then slowly, like from the belly up, it just grew. And before she knew it, she curled over, fell down on the floor, like just laughing roaring like with laughter and tears and whatever else. And, and Jim thought, oh my gosh, she cracked. You know, he was like, oh, this finally did it. Like this was too much. Yeah, we, not only should we not gone out, maybe we just should have never gotten into this. This is too hard. This is too much. I don't know if only I'd been able to get to the bathroom first and kind of clean it up. But now Sarah, what was going on? Finally, he worked up the whatever wherewithal to ask like, Sarah, what is so funny? And Sarah, through her laughter and her tears, said this, she said, she called me mom. <laughs> she called me mom. It was the first time that Misha had called her mom. And I love how God loves our angry prayers. Because you see, sometimes I think you and I are like Jim. We can be like Jim, feeling like, man, we got to protect God from seeing all the red scrawling anger or rage or things that are written across the bathroom walls of our hearts. We got to close that bathroom door before God can get in. And we got to get out the Clorox and the Windex. And we got to scrub down the, 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 the windows. And we got to swipe down the, the walls. And we got to clean it up and polish it up. And maybe we'll 
leave a nice tidy little sticky note, a little post-it note on the mirror that says, sorry, God, I kind of had a bit of a bad day. But we feel like we've got to protect God from the hard stuff, the reality of where we're at and what's going on in us. But the reality is that you and I are like Misha. We have been beat up and broken and by a broken, fallen world that we all, we have these wounds that we carry in from our story. And not only we have the wounds of what's been done to us and in our stories, we have the things that we've done too, that we've done to others. We've got all that going on. And the beauty of the gospel is that God is like Sarah, right? That God is not only big enough to take it, he invites us to come to him as we are, that God is the pursuing God. When you get that he's already drawing near to you and his heart is for you and he sees you in your brokenness and your distance, your losses, he's coming to find you. And what that means is that God delights that we can bring who we are fully before him. We can bring out the rust of the things that we feel like are just going to be too much or all that. We can bring it before him. And I believe God crumples over in a heap of laughter and tears saying, she called me dad. He called me dad. That we're invited into intimacy with God. And you can enter that intimacy fully and vulnerably when you recognize the heart of the God who is for you. I think that, you know, this, this God... He embraces us with surprising joy, and I think that this should shape our prayer life, the way that we pray. That often the danger is that you and I can, I think we can pray more out of a place of trying to be good rather than a place of trying to be honest, right? Uh, Kyle Strobel in his book on prayer, he talks about, man, prayer, properly understood, it's not a place that we come to, to be good for God, to perform for him and try and prove to him that we're in, all those kind of things. Rather, prayer is a place that we come to be honest with God, to enter communion with him, to reorient ourselves and remind ourselves that he is the pursuing God, to bring who we really are and where we really are at in its fullness. And yes, over time, that is going to shape and sanctify and change. And that grace, his love, it works its way from the inside out. Like if Misha 10 years later is still saying, F you mom, F you mom, whatever, like there's, there's probably a problem there. Um, but the reality is it starts with coming before God as we really are. And what, it's, it's like me, back all those years ago in that backyard, it was like finally getting honest with God with where I was really at rather than just trying to perform for God and do all the stuff to, 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 get, to earn his favor. And when you get the gospel, when you get the gospel, I believe one sign of the gospel, the grace of God is honesty in your prayer life. Because if you don't get the gospel, if you think that God is distant and hiding from you and running out there and it's on you to go draw near to him, then the way that you will pray, the way you will approach spiritual practices is like these are things you're doing to try and it, it will lead to legalism where you're doing all this stuff to go out and go out and get to God. Or it will lead to lawlessness where you kind of go, well, that's not working, so I'm just going to go do my own thing, right? But the gospel offers you something different. It's not legalism. It's not lawlessness. It's the love of God who has come for you in Christ and is out to reconcile you to himself, to redeem you and to restore you and to know you in the intimate depths of your being, which means you can take all the deepest brokenness and the things that you have to bring and the things that have been done to you and the things that you've done and the things that you haven't done, and you bring it all out before God because he's already drawn near to you. Because his heart is for you. Because he is the great searcher who has come for you in Christ, who gives you his spirit and who longs to know you in the deepest depths of your being, to be with you and united with you and transform you from the inside out. I used to feel guilty at times when I would pray, you know, often at night I'll pray and I'll go for these walks and I'll pray and I would feel guilty when my thoughts would wander, you know, like, oh, I should be praying about this, but my thoughts are going to something else. And uh, one thing that I found helpful with this, um, this last few years has been what some have called wandering prayer, you know, which is going like, okay, if I'm praying and, I, and my thoughts start to wander over here, that's probably a sign that that's something that 
my heart is dealing with, that I'm concerned with, that I'm thinking about. And so instead, I'll just go pray about that, right? That I want to encourage you that as you pray, you can see prayer not so much as a place to perform for God, as rather a place to be honest with him, to bring your lives and your heart before him, that you are drawing near to the God who's already drawn near to you. There's more here, though, Jesus says. It's not just God greeting us with joy. It's not just God carrying us home. What does God do when he gets home with us? What does he do when he brings us home into his kingdom? Well, in verse 6 and 7, Jesus says this. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He just says here, basically, God throws the biggest block party the town's ever seen when a child of his comes home. Right? Jesus says here that the shepherd gets home, Billy, he's back home, he's got his sheep, and he calls all his friends and neighbors and says, come over, I'm throwing a party, rejoice with me, let's celebrate. And that makes me wonder, who throws a party for their pet, right? It's kind of a weird thing, right? When my wife and I, we first started dating, she had this cat named Iggy, and she loved that cat. I'm not much of a cat person, so... I'm sorry, if you are, you and her can talk and hang out and have fun talking about cats. I don't like cats, but anyways, she loves cats. So we have this cat, Iggy, and one day she calls me at work. She's like, Iggy's lost. I'm like, what? What happened? She's like, Iggy fell out the bathroom window uh, two stories up, fell into the bushes, and now I'm looking, I can't find her. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll see you tonight. She's like, like, no, get over here now and help me. So I'm like, all right, cancel all my meetings. I drive across town, I come over. I'm like, all right, so we're looking on four hours. We're looking under cars. We're looking in the bushes. We're looking in neighbor's backyards. What are you doing in my backyard? We're looking for our cat. Okay, we're, and finally, after four hours, we find Iggy curled up, hiding, scared, back in these bushes, and we brought Iggy home. And I was happy when we got home. But I was happy, like, dude, let's get some takeout and watch Netflix, right, whatever. I wasn't like... Hey, let's call all of our friends and family and spend hundreds of dollars on a bash saying, come rejoice with us, our cat is back, right? Like they would have been like, what are you thinking? What are you doing, Josh? But Jesus is saying, that's what's going on here. That's the way God treats you when he brings you home. God celebrates people you wouldn't expect. Ragamuffins and runaways. This means that you might not feel polished and pretty and put together and whatever, but Christ comes after you and he celebrates you more extravagantly than you would expect. It's interesting, all three lost stories here in Luke 15, they all end with a party, with a celebration. And so you've got uh, the the, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, and it feels like Jesus is building the intensity here. So you go from, uh, you know, like a a sheep to some cold hard cash to a child. And he goes from one out of 100, like 1%, to one out of 10 coins, 10%, to one out of two, 50%. Jesus is upping the ante. He's raising the stakes. And when he gets to the end of God's child, the father's children coming home, he says, man, kill the fattened lamb and throw the biggest bash, put the robe around my child, put the ring on their finger. I am welcoming them home. And this is going to be the biggest block party the town has ever seen. God rejoices over you. He throws the biggest block party when you come home. I love we do. When we do baptisms at our church, we do a big party, a big celebration. I love doing these baptism parties. We're just going, Jesus is saying, man, when a child comes home, The angels are rejoicing. All of heaven is throwing a party, and we want to do the same. We want to throw a party on earth. We want to echo the party in heaven and heaven and earth to be on earth as in heaven, throwing this party as God is welcoming our heavenly father, welcoming his children home. And yet the beauty of this picture of the pursuing God that Jesus is painting here is that God not only celebrates on that moment when you first come to him, he celebrates every time you draw near. He celebrates when you turn to him, when you bring to him who you really are, where you're really at. When you continue to draw near to God, God welcomes you and loves to embrace you and to celebrate you because you're his child. This raises the question this morning, how do you think God sees you? Do you think God sees you as an inconvenience? Like, ah, they haven't really been trying hard enough. They haven't really been 
putting in their hours. I haven't really been doing their stuff. I don't know. Do you think God sees you that way? Like he's out waiting. Or has your understanding and experience been shaped by the gospel? That God is a God who invites you into intimacy, who draws near and calls you to himself and is inviting you to draw near to the God who has already drawn near to you. See, if you believe that ultimately it's about your pursuit of God, then you're going to be focused on your performance and your work and how much stuff you can get done. But when you get the gospel, the good news of the pursuing God, the God who has come for you in Christ, it changes the game. You can now draw near to the God who's already drawn close to you. I'm not saying here for clarity, I'm not saying that we don't pursue God too, right? Like we are called in the gospel, you are called to pick up your cross, to lay down your life, to die to yourself, to live unto God. But what I am saying is when we do all those things, as we do those things, we're simply responding to the God who's already extravagantly pursued us. It's a response of worship to the God who has pursued you. And God comes after you because he loves you, because he places inestimable, valuable value and worth upon you as his child. He has come for you. And so the invitation this morning, I believe, is for us to come to Jesus, that Jesus is the pursuing God. Jesus is the shepherd who left the 99, who left heaven to come to earth, who left not only earth, but to go to the bloodstained cross, who left and left the grave, risen again in glory to reunite you with himself and draw you into life with him forever. If you ever want proof of how much God loves you, how far he is willing to go, the proof is the bloodstained cross. It is the sign of God's extravagant, relentless pursuit. And so as we go to prayer, I would love to invite you to pray with me right now. We're going to pray. And uh, as we pray, I actually want to invite us in time of prayer. We're actually listening for the Spirit. If there's anything that he wants to illuminate from this message today. So would you join me in prayer? And Jesus, we thank you that you are the pursuing God, that you have come to redeem us, you have come extravagantly and relentlessly. We love you and we thank you and we worship you. And God, I want to pray for each person here right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister to your people. God, in the particularity and intricacy of each person's story, you know the ins and outs of each person's story. I don't, Lord. And so God, I pray that you might apply your word this morning to your people. Or maybe there are some of you here who have felt like, man, you've been trying so hard and it's been all about being good and, and all. And God is inviting you this morning, no, to be honest, to bring before him the raw reality of where you're really at. Maybe there are others of you who have felt, man, the whole framework has been, it's been about you pursuing God and he's felt distant. You're not sure what to make of that. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you administer the gospel reality that, God, you are the one pursuing them. They would not only know that in their head, they'd experience that in their heart and their life. So I'm going to create a space right now of silence. And I just want you to invite, invite you to, to listen, to be attentive to the Spirit, to the presence of God and Holy Spirit. If there's anything that you might have to say to particular people right now, I just pray that you would illuminate uh, your word to them and the uniqueness of their story right now. Take a moment now. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can draw near to you because you have already drawn so near to us in Christ. And Jesus, it is in your name and for your glory that we pray, our mighty King. Amen.